Welcome, everyone. Um, this is going to be a very technical talk. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about the topic, and I could talk about this for hours, but apparently I've got 30 minutes, so I need to hurry quite a bit. So, um, my name is Tomasz Ducin. I live in Warsaw, Poland. I work for big companies where I uh, design architecture and implement uh, huge business applications in JavaScript. Apart from that, I train software developer teams on topics like JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, a couple of frameworks, and last but not least, um, asynchronous JavaScript and architecture. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, just drop me an email or follow me on Twitter. So, um, what we're going to start with today is recalling uh, the fundamental piece of the language, and that is functions. We're going to concentrate on synchronous invocation and asynchronous invocation of functions. We'll also mention uh, the mechanics of event loop and the run to completion rule. Having this said, we have the foundation of the first way we can use asynchronous um, programming, and that is callbacks. Next, we'll proceed to a promise. Um, a promise is uh, let's say, a representation of an operation that will be finished in the future. But uh, up front, we already know what we are going to do later with it. If we combine promises with generators, the feature that has been added in ECMAScript 6, then we get a coroutine. A coroutine is a sequence of asynchronous operations that form a consistent bigger thing, uh, let's say a story that will provide multiple steps. If we, ha if we combine multiple coroutines that will talk to each other within one thread without blocking all other things that are uh, happening in the JavaScript thread, we get a pattern that is called communicating sequential processes. Um, it's a pattern that is built into languages like Go or Clojure, and it's also available in C, C++, and that kind of thing. Um, a slight evolution of a coroutine is async await, the feature that is available uh, in this year's JavaScript uh, version in ES8. Um, this branch is closed, at least for now, so we go back to callbacks. If we want to handle events, we can use callbacks as event handlers, but if events um, depend on each other, or if the logic becomes more complex than just binding a click event or whatever, uh, we fall to the same problems as we do with just pure callbacks. So we need a better representation, and there is something that is called reactive streams, which is not only an abstraction over um, events itself, but Actually, it's an uh, abstraction over pretty much everything that moves, <laughs> and it's also very uh, uh, complex at the first step when we try to understand it. So the initial motivation behind the talk was that when I do trainings or when I speak to my colleagues at, at my project, uh, I often find myself in a situation that um, developers mo uh, often don't understand the semantics of asynchronous code or of the patterns, and what they end up doing is basically this. <laughs> So, in order to prevent that, I would like to lay out some foundations of how to deal with asynchronous things and to um, say which, uh, which patterns would suit uh, certain situations. So, the first thing to note is that we cannot make any assumptions about the order of asynchronous operations because it's unreliable, it's untrustworthy, inconsistent, and basically um, pick up a few of these words here. Uh, we cannot make any assumptions of the order because if we do, we make a race condition. And this is one of the most difficult things to debug, right? Uh, because it's non-deterministic. Another thing is we need to be aware uh, when a function is invoked in a synchronous manner and when it's in an asynchronous manner. So uh, an obvious example of synchronous call is um, a for each map filter reduce and this kind of operations on arrays. Um, and uh, like the most um, basic asynchronous call is set timeout, set interval, and this kind of stuff. A uh, less obvious example is a promise, a then, um, callback is going to be called asynchronously, but a promise constructor is going to be called synchronously because a promise is greedy, it has to start immediately, right? Or a reactive stream, it could be called either synchronously or asynchronously. As I said, reactive stream is a very broad uh, abstraction, so it could be both of them. So if we concentrate on the asynchronous one, we can see that there is going to be 
a console log before, then we are going to register the, uh, the timeout callback, and then we are doing after. Always when we have an asynchronous operation, there are two parts. There has to be a synchronous part, which is basically registering the callback, and this is that, uh, that point, right? And only the callback is going to be executed asynchronously. So um, how JavaScript is going to execute is console log, then set timeout that console log. This is one piece. This is one message that will be sent to the message queue. Then there is a turn, because JavaScript work in turns, and then there will be another message, and in this case, it would be probably the inside thing. So what I want us to focus on when we write code is that we try to, let's say, visually cut out all the things that are invoked in an asynchronous manner. So in this case, it's just going to be the callback inside. Just try to cut it in our imagination. Um, slightly more difficult example will be just in a while. So each of these asynchronous uh, calls is going to form a message that will be put on the message queue, right? So we've got a queue and JavaScript work in turns. The event loop will grab the first one from the queue, like it's first in, first out, execute it. Once it's done, it's going to be removed. The next one is going to be uh, executed. And everything is happening in a single thread. This is how JavaScript works internally. And actually, there are more details. Um, and uh, event loop and the message queue are different structures, but uh, that's uh, slightly uh, more complex stuff. So let's take a look at this example. We've got um, five console logs. And now the question is, how do you think what is going to be the order of execution of that? Just speak out loud. One. One is going to be the first, definitely. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be one, four, five, three, two. Um, actually, the order is not that important as the principles behind that, right? So um, the immediately invoked function expression, this funny uh, syntax over here, um, is invoked immediately, which is basically synchronous, right? So we're going to do, uh, we're going to step into the function, do console log one, then we are registering both. Um, um, callbacks, then we go to console log four, then we get out of the function, we call console log five. So this is going to be the first message, right? This is the first message, and it shows how the run to completion rule works. Basically, if we have one piece of code, there is no way for other thing to interrupt it. It has to run until it's completed, right? So. If we have more code here just after the console log five, it will have to be finished before anything else can, uh, can be finished. And then basically we'll pick up the messages that are ready. So the first one would be console log three because it had zero timeout and then it would be uh, console log two because it had uh, one second timeout. By the way, JavaScript um, set timeout and set interval do not uh, guarantee the exact time, they guarantee at least time. And that's because of the run to completion and the fact that concurrency in JavaScript is cooperative and not preemptive. Cooperative means that if we have a queue, let's say, um, um, let's find some real life situations during this uh, real life metaphors during this talk. We have a queue to a, a bathroom, right? There is no way to, let's say, get into the queue without other people waiting. That would be uh, not very nice, right? So we have to wait in our order. There is no possibility that somebody would be more important than other ones, right? So it's cooperative. This means that if I want to execute a function after one second, but there are more messages before me, then I just can't interrupt, right? So that's why I'm cooperative. Uh, An opposite is preemptive. Basically, there might be somebody who is more important and who can just kick the rest out, right? And this is, for example, how operating system works. So having this said, if you want to um, have some actions that will be executed in a repetitive fashion, then we can use events. We've got built-in browser events, just like click, focus. Um, we can observe on a certain element um, that will uh, trigger some events, right? We can have also custom events. Um, we're pretty familiar with that, I suppose. Um, the problem is, if events depend on each other, um, we fall into something that is called callback hell, right? As we know, um, this is a 
pretty good example that shows <laughs> the problem here. Um, many people say that the problem with callback hell is that functions are nested. It is a problem, but actually the, the source of the problem is that the intention of what this code should do and the way the code is written is completely, let's say, far away. There is a huge gap between the intention and how the code is written. So we're trying to find a better way to write the code to understand what is the intention. If somebody will be reading it, um, it should be easier, right? And actually, both promises and reactive streams uh, follow the same approach, which is basically chaining, right? So this way, we go to a promise. A promise is uh, an object that will represent uh, an operation in the future, blah, blah, blah. I, I suppose that we know that. So let's skip the basics and let's concentrate on something less obvious, and that is promise limitations. So a promise can um, represent only a single item. What if we want to return or resolve a promise with multiple items? That's a difficult thing. We might wrap it in a structure, like an array or an object, but at the next step of a promise, we would have to destructure it, so there would be quite a lot of overhead that would make the code very uh, little readable. Then, a promise is a one-time item. Uh, if a promise uh, settles down so it uh, succeeds or fails, we cannot reuse it to uh, do the operation again, we would have to do another promise. Then, promises are greedy. It means that if I have a promise, it's started, uh, if I create a promise, it's already running, right? There is no button to press start, right? It's already running. There is no way to, um, to make a promise that will start later. We have to chain it. Um, values are unavailable outside the chain. This is the most common rookie mistake that people try to access a promise from uh, the value of the promise from outside, and actually, instead of getting the value, they get the promise itself. The only way to access the value is to put the code inside the promise chain. And finally, we've got for each step of the promise, we've got only the previous step available. What if I make a um, a promise chain, and I would like to get the previous value, uh, the two values before, the two steps before, and the three steps before. I would have to inject them, and again, there would be uh, pretty difficult, or I could nest promises, which is also a very bad solution, right? So, promises are nice, and promise chains are nice, but they have quite big limitations. Um, so, let's take a look at this example. We've got async op1, um, which returns a promise. We are chaining another operation. So um, the result of async op1 becomes input of async op2. Uh, output of async op2 becomes input uh, of operation 3, and so on. We wrap the thing in a function so that we can reuse it outside. The only way to um, get the value is basically to, get to uh, make another step. So what we have right here is actually sequential processing, right? So this way we can enforce that one operation has to finish before another one can start, right? And we can wrap the thing within a function. We can uh, use it in many places. We just um, need to get a next step from the outside. Um, so sequential processing is one approach. The other approach is parallel processing. So we create multiple promises, right? But we don't attach any then callback to them. The fact that we have multiple promises in our hands, in our variables, or in a, in a list, whatever, it already means that they're running in parallel. So here I can use any kind of aggregate. Here it's just a promise all that I expect that we are pretty familiar with. Um, th in this way, all the promises will be running in parallel. And again, we can wrap it in a function, and we can reuse it in other places. So. Um, Promise.all is only one aggregate. There are more of them. So each of promise aggregates has its own predicate. For promise all, the predicate is that all promises have to uh, f uh, resolve so that the whole thing resolves with all their values. If any of the promises fails, then the predicate is not possible anymore, right? So we are not waiting for the rest. We will fail with the reason of the first that is failing, right? So if the first one succeeds, then we're still waiting, because all has to succeed. If the first thing fails, then we fail immediately. We're not waiting for the rest. Um, another aggregate that is built into ES6 standard is promise race, which is very tricky. Um, 
the predicate here is that the first promise that settles, so it's either resolves or rejects, settles the whole thing without waiting for the rest. Um, it's always good to think about real-life situations in this case. A uh, good real-life situation of promise all is, uh, I want to go to vacation. One promise is that I have money, uh, basically to spend there. I have accommodation, basically to have somewhere to sleep, and I get some days off so that my boss allows me to go. If any of these uh, is not, uh, it does not succeed, then the whole thing breaks, right? Um, if we try to think about a real-life situation of a promise that race, this is going to be slightly more um, difficult, which we'll see in a while. Um, people, like 99% of people that I talk to, um, confuse promise race with promise any, that is uh, not a part of the standard, it's part of the Bloober library. The predicate here is that at least one has to succeed, right? Um, when I ask about promise race example, real life, uh, people uh, most often give an example, let's say, of a car race, that the first car that reaches the, the finish will basically resolve. That's a good thing for the positive situation. But if one of the cars hits a tree, like, let's say that they, the driver didn't die, uh, he's okay, but he can't uh, just carry on, right? His promise has failed. Does it mean that the whole race is over? No. All the rest of the drivers will basically carry on, so it's not a race, it's promise.any, right? So in promise.race, we need to think about the negative solution, that the first one that fails will fail the whole thing. And finally, we've got promise sum, which is a tiny generalization over promise any. It's not at least one has to succeed, but it's at least n has to succeed. In this case, it's at least two. So if I have two promises that succeed, the whole thing succeeds. If I have three promises, having a list of four promises, three promises that fail, then the predicate is not uh, possible anymore. So basically, we fail the whole thing. Um, so we've got promises covered. Now we want to uh, combine promises with generators, so just a small um, word here. Uh, a generator is a new type of function that is available in ES6. The new thing is uh, generators can suspend and resume. They basically fall asleep and they wake up, right, to continue with their code. Just an ordinary function. When we call an ordinary, uh, ordinary function, it has to finish. Well, it can break, but it has to finish and it has to return a value. A generator, on the other hand, can yield a value, go to sleep, but when we ask for the next value, it will wake up, do some code, yield the next value, and go back to sleep again. And we could have, um, like, very complex um, implementations inside the generator. So uh, we're calling and we're creating an uh, instance of the generator uh, and assign it to the iterator. An iterator is lazy by the nature. This is the whole idea behind generators. Instead of doing the whole processing over a big array, we just want to do only one step that we need, right? It's going to be one thing, the only thing that we require. This is why it's lazy. It's not starting uh, at this point. So the first thing that will be um, console locked here is the outside. Right? Then we are going to call iterator next. This is the moment that the generator will wake up. It will do console log one inside, then it will yield A, which will be uh, returned from iterator.next. Then we are then the um, control flow is returned back to the other side, to this uh, outer scope. Then we do console log to outside, then we call iterator.next again. So the generator wakes, wakes up, does his thing until he uh, happen, uh, steps upon the next yield. Then the control is uh, given back to the other side. Then we do console log three outside, and basically this is how it works. In this case, the generator is not over yet. It's just sleeping on the last yield. So we can um, make generator sleep and we can awake him. If we combine generators and generators are synchronous. If we combine promises and generators, we get a really uh, nice uh, new um, pattern that is called a coroutine. The way it works is a coroutine is going to base on promises and is going to return a promise. So it's going to be greedy. It's starting immediately. When we are um, stepping upon a promise, we suspend the generator. We are waiting for the promise while it's pending. When the promise resolves, we are going to, when it's uh, either resolved or rejected, we are going to call next on the iterator. So we wake up the iterator, right? And uh, basically, a resume uh, will um, 
uh, the, when uh, the promise is settled, it will resume the generator. We go to the point where we uh, go back to suspend on promise, and this is basically a loop, right? So there would be a loop that will call uh, then on a promise, next on the generator, then on a promise, next on the generator. And this is, let's say, a perpetuum mobile that will basically uh, make this thing uh, running. We're just missing one tiny thing, and that is a tiny wrapper that will make native promises and coroutines work together. And this is just a couple of lines that do the right thing. Let's call it async for a short for now. Um, so it's it's this environment that is going to call then, next, then, next. We don't have to care about the inner implementation of that. So the idea of promises is that we want asynchronous operations to be written in linear manner. The idea behind coroutines is that we want asynchronous code to be written in synchronous manner so that we won't have the chaining thing. We would have just literal and looking like synchronous code but executed in an asynchronous manner. So we've got a generator that is uh, named sequential here. So the important thing is that we are yielding promises, right? We could yield a primitive, but it doesn't make sense. We are yielding promises. When we are yielding promises, we are going to suspend. We're going to stop the generator for now. And it's going to be automatically resumed when the promise uh, resolves. And what yield is doing, it's not returning the promise itself, it's returning a value. Are you familiar with video games Mortal Kombat? Do you know Mortal Kombat? Hands up. Good. So let's say we have a match. Two characters are fighting, one of them has won, and it takes up the victim, it's a fatality, and it pulls out his heart, right, aggressively. And this is actually what the yield keyword is doing, right? It gets the promise and it pulls out the value from it. It was not possible to do with native promises, but it's possible to do with uh, coroutines right now. So what a coroutine, uh, how coroutine is going to work? It's executing the code until the first yield. It's pausing on a promise. When the promise resolves, it will return the value of the promise to v1. Then it proceeds, stops on another promise, uh, um, uh, resumes when it's resumed, and so on and so on. And finally, it returns a promise to the outside world. So the consumer does not have to worry if it's a promise chain, if it's a coroutine or whatever. It's just an inner implementation. And we need to um, wrap it with the async function. So this is going to be a closure. So the way it's working is just sequential thing. We can wrap it in a function. We can use it from the outside. But the thing is, we need to worry about this async thing. We need to wrap it. And uh, hopefully, and um, thankfully, uh, somebody thought, like, why just not inject it to the language, right? And this is how async await was made, right? We don't have to carry about, uh, worry about that. So um, we're just replacing the asterisk near to the function keyword with the async keyword, and we're replacing the yield with await. Right? And basically, that's all. So async await is the same as coroutines, it just promises plus generators. It's a function that is going to stop when we're waiting for a pending promise. And we don't have this wrapper. So this is sequential processing. If you want to have parallel processing with um, coroutines, we are starting multiple operations at the same time so that we've got P1, P2, P3, P4. They're all promises. Note the difference that uh, here, I am awaiting a promise or yielding a promise. Here I'm not yielding, uh, neither yielding nor waiting. I'm just assigning a promise to a variable or to a list, any kind of structure. And the fact that I have multiple promises in my hands means already they're running in parallel, right? So again, we can wrap it in a function, we can reuse it from the outside, and instead of using the asterisk and the yield keyword, we can basically replace it with async await keywords, but it's exactly the same mechanics. Um, yeah, so as you can see, if I have a promise, I can, just, uh, uh, I can just put an await or yield before it, and this, was, this will make JavaScript pause at this point, and the yield p1 or await p1 uh, expression will basically return the value, right? If there is any error, both in coroutines and async await, like a promise will uh, fail, then the whole thing will fail. So the, the, um, 
the promise that is going to be returned from this function will basically uh, reject with the reason of the error that was thrown. This is uh, how this async uh, implementation is working and how the async uh, await is working. All right, so we've got covered async await and um, you might be wondering when to use it. So basically async await is a next step forward over promise chains, which does pretty much the same thing, but is more flexible and gives us more, let's say, uh, it's more convenient to use. A good use case for async await is a story, a multiple step process, for instance. So let's say we've got a banking interface. I want to create a new transfer. So I click here, and this is the moment that I am starting the coroutine or starting the async await process. So the first step is I am waiting for the user to input the data and to click go on and obviously to validate. So this is the first promise that I am yielding or awaiting. The next thing, I am pushing this data into the server, so it's the second promise I'm awaiting. Now, I've got the view, uh, and I'm awaiting for the user to confirm if the transfer is okay, so this is the third promise that I'm awaiting, user interaction. Then, when he clicks, I'm sending the confirmation to the server, so it's the fourth promise that I am awaiting. And finally, I'm displaying the user the information that, all right, your uh, transfer has been scheduled. Right, so this was the, five, uh, the fifth promise, which is going to be uh, returned from the overall process. And from the outside, I can, this might be encapsulated in a function. And from the outside, I am um, attaching a, another then, which will basically reload the list of transfers uh, to add a new item. So basically, a multi-step process, uh, a longer story that consists of sequential uh, process is a very good use case for coroutines and async await and um, doing it with RxJS might really not be a good idea because RxJS is going to uh, handle repetitive things. There is no repetition here. There are different steps. This is the important part. So this way we are um, going to speak about streams. So here we've got an array. An array is something that we have um, available up front. We've got all the items in the memory already. So we can map, reduce, find, folder, uh, filter, and so on. We can uh, transform the whole structure because we have it in our hands already. A stream, um, on the other hand, is a collection that will be growing over time. So we can't process it. Uh, we can't process the whole structure because we don't have it yet, right? An item is going to be pushed uh, to the item. It's going to be uh, pushed over time. It's going to, uh, the collection is going to grow over time. And we don't actually know when will these items arrive. And actually, I don't know if I can expect some more items uh, to be pushed into the stream or not. So I also have to denote whether the stream is still opened or if it's closed, right? And also, if I have arrays and I'm doing a map, I'm going to dump the whole array into a new array at one step. And then the next map will do the whole uh, processing over one over the whole array. With streams, however, I'm going to push item by item. So if I use the same uh, higher order functions, the map, then I'm going to uh, process element by element. So with arrays, I'm doing horizontal processing, and with streams, I'm doing vertical. So for one item that is pushed, I'm going to do the whole processing, right? And um, the thing, the important thing about RxJS, uh, reactive streams, is, uh, oh, one more thing. If we uh, say about arrays, we can manipulate only the data, right? And with streams, we can manipulate data and the time. Um, as David said yesterday, it's a nice um, a metaphor. A time is becoming a first-class citizen in terms of streams, because in arrays everything is synchronously, immediately, and there is no way to do it in another way. So, um, the important thing about streams is that uh, they are difficult to learn, the learning curve is, is pretty high, and this is because streams could be either sync or async. There might be just uh, items might be pushed to the stream in both ways, right? We need to know which one is that. Um, there might be no item, one item, or multiple items pushed into a stream. Again, it depends. And we've got lots of operators that might be processing all this stuff. Um, a stream might be opened or it might be closed. 
another thing we need to think about. Um, streams based on inversion of control, uh, Hollywood principle, it means that uh, basically it's uh, don't call us, we will call you. So we invert the control that instead of imperatively asking for what is the data, doing some ifs and basing on it, we are pushing an item into the stream and the second uh, part will basically react to the item pushed. This is why streams are reactive. This is the inversion of control. And finally, we're using the observer pattern because we're observing on what is going on within the stream. We are iterating over items and in order for the whole thing to succeed, we need to do a functional paradigm um, approach. So if we uh, uh, compare promise and observable uh, APIs, we can see that with promises, we've got just on success, which is going to be executed once, and on failure, which is going to be executed like uh, either one or another only once. Right? And with observables, we've got on next, which is going to be executed for each item. If there is an error, there would be on error, so it's just like on failure. And we also have on completed, so if the stream is still opened or if it's completed. So um, the promises are pretty easy because the then is always async. There is always exactly one item. And when the promise is pending, it's opened. When the promise is settled, it's closed. A promise is, let's say, a very narrow part of what the whole observables cover, right? So it's, it's, uh, this is how we can uh, map promises to observables. It's just a very tiny piece of the whole thing. So you might be uh, familiar with this MAM that everything is a stream, and we're going to uh, focus on it for a while. So um, I would like us to think about some metaphors in order to better understand the concepts behind reactive streams. So we've got observable. An observable is, let's say, a DOM node that we can observe for events that it's triggering. Uh, also, we can have object.observe, a feature that was a part of Chrome and was removed. Never mind. Another type of observable is observable stream. This is just yet another type of observable. We've got observables, observers, and subscriptions. So in this situation where we're here in the room, I am an observable because you are uh, watching me, you are listening to me, right? You all are observers, right? And the fact that you are starting to listen to me is you are starting a subscription, right? So you can visualize it that I am one point, you are all other points, and there are links between each of you and me, and these are the subscription. You can start listening to me, you can stop listening to me, <laughs> this is just uh, finishing the subscription, then you can uh, resubscribe, and so on, right? So the fact that you're listening to something is subscription being uh, open or closed. Then uh, comes the, qu ah, and one more thing. Um, right now, I am saying few words, and I am emitting items through a stream, right? So in this sentence, I have emitted 15 words. It means each one is an item, right? We can um, think of a stream also as a sequence of words. There were 15 words in this sentence, which means that each of your subscription got the on the next function invoked 15 times for each of these. It's a really good thing that you basically think about the world that surrounds you and try to think of observables. What is an item that is going to be triggered? Is it going to be triggered synchronously or asynchronously? Is the subscription opened or closed? And this kind of stuff. Now, there comes a question. Um, one of the most, uh, most frequently asked questions is, what is the difference between hot and cold observables? Let's use a metaphor again. So right now, I'm standing, I'm saying some words. You might be listening to me, and then you get the subscription. It might happen that, basically, you're reading and browsing Twitter, so you stop the subscription, right? And after, let's say, three minutes, you resubscribe again. And the three minutes that you have not been listening means that you have lost the content of these three minutes. There is no way, in this case, there is no way to get it back, right? Because I'm a hot observable. It means when I start talking, I'm already emitting. And it doesn't matter if anybody is listening to me, maybe it does matter in this situation, but if there is nobody listening, I am emitting the things, right? Even if there is nobody, because there is just one source of the data, and this is me, because I am hot, right? This is a definition of hot. <laughs> <laughs> and this video is being recorded, hello, and uh, when, 
uh, people will be watching, hopefully thousands of people, uh, will be watching the video on YouTube. Um, each person will increase the page view, the, the, the view of the video, and each person is going to get its own subscription at its own state, right? So there would be multiple sources, right? Everybody could pause and resume and this kind of stuff, so there would be multiple sources, one for each subscription. This would be a cold observable. Right? So a hot observable starts emitting uh, immediately, and it doesn't matter if there are subscribers. A cold one is going to be created exactly at the point where a subscription begins. Um, another thing, let's say that I have so many things that I forget what I should say, right? and I need to have a prompter somewhere right, <laughs> at the backstage, which will whisper what I should say if I forget to say my things. So, I am subscribing to the prompter. If he says something, then I will re-say it. I will re-emit the words. But also, if I remember my th stuff, I will emit it myself. And you are subscribing to me. I am a subject, because I am some kind of a proxy. I am listening to other sources, and I might be emitting my uh, data myself. So, I am some kind of a proxy in the middle, I'm a subject, right? There are different way, uh, different type of subjects. They vary, vary on how many items uh, do you get when you subscribe too late, how many items are being remembered, and this kind of stuff. And finally, uh, back pressure. Let's say that I am saying so much stuff that you just can't process, right? It's just too much or too fast. And you have two options. You can decide, all right, I can't process everything live because there is just too much. So I will write down what I have in my mind. If I lose something in the meantime, sorry, no, nobody is perfect, right? Uh, and when I'm free, then I will start, let's say, processing the items again. This is lossy back pressure, right? I know that I'm not able to process everything. I might lose something. That's my design. But if I don't want to lose things, then I might be writing the thing that I'm processing right now, but I can also record the things. And when I have spare time, I can just play the record and process it back again later. But the thing, uh, the thing here is that I don't lose things, but up front I need to know that I will have some spare time to process it back, right? So um, really, uh, I encourage you to try this kind of looking at the surrounding world and try to see uh, all the streams around. And the most important question here is, does your app really need to handle all these issues? If it does, then RxJS will be a perfect match for your app. But if you don't need to handle things like uh, subjects, back pressure, uh, hot cold observables, or you just shoot simple AJAX request and uh, listen to uh, objects uh, emitting events, then this might be basically an overkill. All right, so a uh, small demo time. This is a simple application that I have an input for amount of money that I want to uh, exchange to foreign currencies, and I have four foreign currencies. Um, I get real-time notification, and whenever the uh, rate of a currency changes, I want to see how much money can I buy within my sum. Also, at the same time, I can change the money that I do have. I can uh, add something here. Blah blah blah. So basically, as you can see, there are um, there is live data, uh, real-time data that I need to process, and also there is some user interaction that will uh, reflect to this, reflect to to these changes. So the more things that are happening in my interface, both from UI perspective and from the data that is constantly changing, increases the probability that RxJS will actually make it easier uh, for me to tackle with this application. Right. So. These are all the concepts that we have uh, covered. If there is just one sentence I would like you to remember after this presentation is, if you have a single operation that is just, I know there is nothing more, there is just a single operation, use promises. If you have a sequence of asynchronous operations that form a consistent story, use coroutines or async await. If you have repetitive things, repetitive actions, then if it's easy and it's not complex, uh, the events do not depend on each other, go with events. But if they do rely on each other, if it's complex, and basically, if you have real-time data or you have UI that some pieces of the UI depend on each other, and it really makes difficult to do it in an imperative way, reactive streams is the way forward. So that's all I've got, um, and thank you very much.